Hi, hello everyone. Today we have with us uh, Paolo Guenzi from Bocconi University. Hi, hello Paolo, how are you? I'm fine. I'm very happy to be here with you and thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, so could you kick it off with a couple of keywords about yourself, some insights so we know a little bit more about you? Well, I define myself a work in progress of my school of Bocconi because I graduated there and then they kept me inside, processing me, trying to, me, trying to make me better and better to send me out to the job market. But uh, I'm still not so perfect. So I'm still working there. I got my PhD at Bocconi and then I started working there and then I fell in love with sales. Uh, I always say that basically it could be in the genes because my, my father, was a salesperson and my mother was, was a professor, was a teacher. So I wanted to make both of them happy. So I decided, well, I will teach sales. But doing this, I, I hope I made both of them happy. Uh, so when we talk about sales, I, I would start uh, you know, with our discussion and talk about everything there is to know about this perspective. Uh, a lot of people you know, have this discussion about sales and marketing, what's the difference, where does one start, one end. So what would you say to all the people that maybe don't have uh, some background in, in business or economics, but maybe even if they do, what is the difference between sales and marketing? And is there any? Well, it's a, it's a very good question. Oftentimes, even executives and managers working in companies, they ask me, what's the difference? I think it largely depends on how companies interpret the roles and responsibilities of different people. The, the key thing is that most companies in the world have human beings who are in, in, in charge of managing relationships with other human beings. So uh, whenever um, this interaction is not mediated, uh, fully by technology or by other communication tools. Whenever we have interpersonal relationships between a buyer and the seller, then we have selling. And we have people who are in charge of uh, uh, interacting with customers. So it's a human side of marketing, if you want, where people can and should make a difference in understanding customer needs, relating to the customer individually, and uh, creating value for customers individually, one by one. And usually in doing this, these people also have to um, integrate and align their activities with the more mass market initiatives that marketing typically does through advertising or market research. Um, so usually marketing is broader and more general, whereas uh, uh, selling is more interpersonal and specific, and I would say even more pragmatic. Uh, in that sense, how could they integrate more? So how could they maybe enhance uh, their relationship and coordination between sales and marketing? They often, you know, have bad words uh, for each other and shifting blames. You can always hear that. So how to avoid that? I think, first of all, there's a lot of stereotyping and prejudice in a sense. So how do you fight this? Uh, the first thing is what most companies do is they try to uh, try to put people in, in their college shoes. And they do this, for example, through job rotation. Many companies, uh, uh, when, when they hire someone who is willing to work in marketing, for example, they let these people spend their first six months, one year in sales on the front line, directly interacting with customers. Because then when they move to the marketing roles and they interact with people from sales, they are more credible because they have spent uh, part of their life directly interacting interacting with customers. So job rotation is an example, but uh, there are also some relatively trivial things like, for example, I always tell marketing managers, product managers, well, why do you always stay in your office? Just go out with your salespeople and go and see what happens in the stores, what happens in front of the customer uh, when, you, when you interact with buyers or in B2B settings, uh, because then you see what, what happens to your customers or what happens when you have a B uh, to C uh, uh, setting and, and then we have resellers of your product. 
what happens when you into in between. So it, it's a sort of reality check. So on the one side, uh, uh, marketers need to be more um, uh, concretely related to the market, go out, and in a sense, says people need to be, have a broader perspective and just not just be guided by um, everyday urgencies or the need of only their specific customers by losing uh, the big picture. So it's a matter of relating them. And this can be done through, for example, also inf information and communication technologies help share information, for example, much more easily. And uh, customer relationship management systems or digital technologies allow a better collection and sharing of information uh, uh, more rapidly and more accurately. So that definitely helps. But then also some other things, for example, there's some fascinating studies showing that uh, by simply sharing the physical space in the office, they talk to each other much more. And this informal communication helps a lot creating the psychosocial context where they listen to each other and they genuinely want to understand and take the perspective of their colleagues and then uh, um, talking to them and, and helping them when needed. So uh, let's go back to all the uh, salespeople. So what is their role? What is basically the role of sales? Why does it exist? Why is it important? And especially, uh, let's say, for the context of this uh, platform where we develop innovative solutions uh, and you try to introduce innovations to the market, how does uh, sales relate to that? What is the role? Well, first of all, I would say that before talking to these people, we should talk about selling, because I think that selling is everyone's job. Uh, because everybody working in any social entity like a company has to sell ideas to someone else, has to sell his or her opinions, his or her view of, of the things. So in general, selling means understanding your counterparts needs and, uh, and uh, beliefs. And, and then communicating in the most credible, logical and persuasive oftentimes way, your genuine ideas. And if you have value, uh, it's not simply enough to have value, but uh, have value is nothing if you, cannot, if you cannot decently communicate it and deliver it to someone. So this is, we live in a world of ideas. So I think the core competence for everyone is not simply to generate ideas, but it's also to communicate and deliver ideas to someone else. So selling is, is literally everyone's job. And especially if we focus, for example, on entrepreneurs, uh, there are some, some interesting studies of entrepreneurs and, and, and basically many of them uh, completely forget about selling. They leave the selling part of their job to someone else because they're so in, strongly convinced that their product, their solution, their app, whatever, will sell itself then, then they forget, they focus very much on the quality of what they do and without carefully uh, reflecting on how can they best communicate this. So I think generally speaking, there is an important role of these people is to, is to communicate value of whatever organization, of whatever entity. So that's a very important nature, uh, um, task of selling which is usually incorporated among other things because there are also other communication tools, but in many cases, safe people play a key role. This is just a starting point. Then the second fundamental role, especially for organizations, companies that are uh, in search of innovation is to uh, um, generate and create value by providing insights because these people uh, have to know so much about the market, about the customer, about competitors, that they should bring ideas. I always say the best sales manager I met in my life, he used to say, the only thing I ask my sales people is to bring ideas. That's the key because anything else will follow from this. I know I am not asking them to sell anything. I'm asking them to bring ideas because they must know so much about the market, about the customer, about competitors, that they should turn that knowledge into ideas, which is the highest possible value creating role of these people. As a minimum, they should bring information. If they can bring some knowledge, not simply information, but some more 
more, more elaborated form of information that's better. If they can bring ideas and insights, it's even better. And these ideas may be related to obviously innovative ways of doing things in terms of innovative services, innovative products, but also innovative way process of managing processes and customer relationship activities, because this is what they do every day. So creating a setting, a context where they can do this, I think is a key challenges for most organizations. And individually, for all of us, if we can use our uh, customer interaction time, our, our uh, customer individual customer sensing capabilities, we can generate ideas and then we should be able to communicate as, 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 as well as possible. So these are the two extremes, communicating and generating value. In between is, is the role of uh, bridging and uh, orchestrating uh, organizational resources, because oftentimes the salespeople are the main point of connection with the customer, and they are supposed to integrate sparse capabilities, knowledge, talent, skills, resources of an organization and orchestrate the winning proposition for the customer, which is a blend of product and services and relations that in the end can bring value to the customer. And this is largely related on the concept of knowledge brokerage, which is basically uh, to what extent can these people uh, raise knowledge, generate knowledge and aggregate knowledge from their colleagues and deliver this to the customer a, a crafting a, a, a knowledge combination uh, um, specifically devoted customer by customer on those customer needs. And they are the only ones who can orchestrate the organizational knowledge in a way which is perfectly customized to every single customer needs. This is what ideally they should be doing. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned you know, value creation and it's always mentioned when we're talking about sales. So how can uh, salespeople and people that interact with the customers provide even more value to them? Of course, they provide great value to the organization itself, but how can they and what can they do in terms of providing value to the customer that they serve? Well, there's several ways of doing this. To me, the key idea is, is, is this uh, concept of knowledge brokerage. Because nowadays, the, the most of value creation for customers come from bringing them accurate and customized knowledge. Then the question becomes, what knowledge is relevant to my customer? Who possesses that knowledge? How can I gather that knowledge and, uh, uh, and deliver that knowledge to my customer? And part of it could be knowledge that as a salesperson, I personally possess. Knowledge about the product, that's a perfect thing. Then it could be some colleagues knowledge because probably in my organization, there's someone else could be uh, uh, technical engineers or service consultant experts who possess some other knowledge. And I don't necessarily need to possess it myself as a salesperson, but what I need to do is to find out who in my organization uh, knows that those things that are relevant to my customers. A third source of knowledge, in addition to myself and my colleagues could be partners because usually in an ecosystem of a company, there could be partners that possess some knowledge, which can be again delivered to customers. And then if you think about it, a fourth source of knowledge are other customers, because the, the, the funny thing is usually uh, um, a, a single salesperson could know more customers than one of his or her customer himself. So uh, if I sell, I don't know, coffee to a bar, for example, my counterpart is a bar owner. Now, what knowledge is, is relevant to that, to that bar owner? It could be knowledge about managing his or her business, which is a bar, a bar outlet, a store, right? Now, now as, as, as a salesperson, I will probably be in contact with 100 bar owners, right? And I see every day what they do in their store and everything they do in their store, which increases the profit and the business of that coffee store, that bar, is potentially a good idea for someone else. And uh, I'm pretty sure that every bar owner in the world, they don't have the chance to interact with 100 other bar owners as a salesperson does. So you see what I mean? The fact is that every salesperson has a potential to bring some knowledge, even from customer to customer, obviously to the extent that they don't compete one, one with another. But, but the idea is uh, if they really are uh, inside uh, fi uh, um, finders, 
they can generate insights on every on, on everything that matters to the customer, not necessarily the, the, the product they sell, but the business of the customer, they become customer business expert. So what is the best way to manage a bar? And there's basically an unlimited set of ideas and that can be brought there, right? And the, there simply does not exist a, a degree in barology. <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> thought about how, how, to, how to manage a bar if you think about it. And the same thing is true for most businesses in the world. So that's what, this is the essence of knowledge brokerage when you can bring uh, relevant knowledge to your customer. But to do this, you really need to figure out what knowledge is relevant to, to your customer. And this depends industry by industry on, on, on the customer business model. If we talk about B2B settings, business to business, to business settings, I mean, when your customer manage, manage a business, like, like a case of the bar, for example, or a distributor or, or, or a company, whenever this is the case. And if it is an individual person, that's exactly the same thing. Think about selling an insurance policy. Again, you need to figure out what is a good value for my customer. And you usually, that could be product related, related to what to sell, but it could be everything else. So value is very subjective, it's very dynamic, it's very multidimensional. And uh, there's almost an unlimited set of value drivers customer by customer. And you can try to detect them through market research, but you will never do this individually with market research. So the third person is the adapter that can turn a general idea of what value is or could be from your company into an individual customized value proposition, which is crafted around the needs and preference of exactly that specific individual. But this implies a lot of ability in terms of observation. You need to be a very good observer. You, mean, you, 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 you need to be a very good listener. You need to ask the right question. The more, the more your genuine interest in, in what matters to your customer, the more you are in a position where you can drive any innovative ideas in his or her direction, which is exactly what they expect from you, which is exactly the essence of what value is or could be in selling. Do you have any advice on how to ask the right questions? How can you practice that? So if, if you've never been in sales or you just want to start or you are an entrepreneur and you have to engage, you have to do the selling part, uh, how can you ask the right questions? I think we, we can all train ourselves on this, if you think about it. Because in, and this is, this is why selling is so fascinating, because selling has to do basically mainly with interpersonal communication. And we all have the, the uh, interpersonal communication practices every day uh, with the girlfriend, the boyfriend, the father, the son, uh, uh, whoever, right? And so, uh, in, I think that training ourselves to ask more questions, to listen to others, and trying to uh, uh, speak less and listen more is, 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 a, is a first fundamental thing, which is, I think we don't live in a society that stimulates us very much to do this. And especially with social media, and we tend to talk to and to listen to other, to have interpersonal communication less and less. But exactly because this is the trend, the more we can do it, the more we build a relatively scarce and limited talent, which I think is fundamental. So uh, uh, one key thing is try to uh, ask people, ask people what they think, ask people how they feel, uh, ask people to tell some something about them because creating some preliminary, uh, uh, sharing some, in, some, some interpersonal information creates a precondition for them talking about maybe business needs. So you always have to keep in mind this parallel uh, uh, pathway, right? On the one side, there's the interpersonal, which is always a little bit uh, risky because if you invade someone else, uh, uh, um, privacy, you ask too much, maybe you, you may look, this is also very culturally sensitive, it largely depends on the culture. What I do in Italy could necessarily be appropriate in Croatia. What I do in Northern Italy is completely different from what is accepted in Southern Italy. And I'm sure it's the same in Croatia. So this is cultural sensitivity. And we, you train ourselves to the extent that you can really develop an ability to ask open questions. So if someone tells you very, very, start, keep asking why, 
<laughs> if someone tells you, well, how are you? I'm fine. What do you mean by fine? So let's ask people to, to specify what they mean. Because yes, no will hardly help you make some progress in knowing someone else. So there's a lot of tricks in there and, or, or techniques for raising things. And I think the more, the more we ask why, or I'm interested, could you please tell me something more about it? Because I'm, I'm really curious. It's not just about asking questions. It's also about everything we do is simply by, if I look you, uh, if, if, I mean, we, we all realize if, if someone is genuinely listening to us, if they have re if they really have to show some interest or if they do it just because they're faking it, right? So first of all, yes, exactly. So first of all is we really need to be genuine to be genuinely curious. That, that's, a fun, that's a nice thing, curiosity. There's some research showing that curiosity is, is a key precondition for being successful in sales. It could be also true for other jobs, but in sales, being curious is very important. So train yourself to be curious. Uh, it's, not, it's not only about asking questions to someone else. It starts from asking questions to ourselves. So put yourself in a situation where every day you try to do something new. Every day you try to learn something new. And because this will train you to be more interested in things in general. And then, then it, will, it will come natural to be interested in someone else because it, it will be, you become curious on everything. And so uh, the way to do this, well, there's a lot of, again, there's no real uh, right or wrong thing. It really depends on first, first of all, understanding who is in front of you. That, that's a key thing. First of all, knowing yourself. So understanding your own way of communicating and observing yourself in the mirror is really interesting. It's, it's, it's an interesting exercise. And even now with, the, with, the, with the, this uh, technology mediated communication, you can observe yourself more and maybe uh, video record yourself and then see uh, 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 how you relate to others. And that, that's also an important way of training yourself. And then in understanding who is in front of you, uh, uh, what kind of people, because there, there is no single best way to relate to other. Uh, it depends on who's in front of you and, and understanding uh, 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 all the visual cues uh, that someone is sending to you is something that is relevant and we can all train ourselves on this. So what I'm curious about, and I'm sure other people are, are as well, um, let's try to break sales into a process. So where does it begin and where does it end? Especially for, let's say, if you're developing something new or starting a business, starting your own project, uh, you know, how do you uh, integrate all that stuff? So where does it begin and where does it end and does it end? Does sales end or is it more of a continuous uh, thing that you do? I don't think this is a wonderful question because I all, whenever I, co I, I, I work with companies, I always start from this. I ask them, please show me your selling process. And after 28 years doing this job today, I think that it's, it's, it's incredibly a very, very minor minority of companies that have some formal representation of the selling process. So, uh, uh, which is important because that means that most companies let uh, their salespeople sort of improvising on what to do. And it, it is difficult to frame uh, uh, selling as a process, but uh, to me, that selling is a process. It has to be interpreted as a process. And generally speaking, my point of view is that although different conceptualization and models of selling exist, all of them share the idea that there are three fundamental things, phases. The first phase is what you do before interacting with your customer. The second is what you do when you interact with your customer. And the third is what you do after having interacted with your customer. Then we can break down these three macro phases into sub phases. The assumption is you have something to something to sell. So you have something, you have something to sell and you want to sell it to someone, okay? Then the, the first thing, the pre-interaction phase, what you do before interacting with the customer is basically finding prospecting. So finding potential customers. So who can be interested, what, whatever you sell. You might sell a music a CD or a, 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 a video report on something or whatever, right? You might have everything. 
And so the first thing is who, who could be interested in this? And prospecting means finding who could be interested in what you want to sell, uh, which has to do with uh, 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 prioritizing uh, based on the fit between your selling proposition, what's the value of what to sell, and the needs of someone. And this is far from being an obvious exercise. Uh, uh, because there's many ways of analyzing uh, customer potential or segmentation, but you should do this at the individual level because that, then you need to pick the people who could be interested in, in what to sell. Second uh, sub phase in the in the pre-interaction phase is everything related to planning, which means preparing. If you want to, if you, if you have found that Paolo could be an interesting prospect, then the thing is, okay, what should I know about Paolo exactly? How can I plan what to, to tell to Paolo when I meet with him? And, and then obviously you need to develop a contact with Paolo, but you need to do your homework. So the more you know about Paolo before meeting with Paolo, the more you will be prepared in, okay, you accept your agenda. And uh, what do you want to achieve when you meet with Paolo? Uh, uh, what is the key message that you want to deliver? How can you prepare some, can you imagine some objections that, that Paolo will raise when you meet him? Do you, can you develop in advance some counter arguments? Is there anything you want to ask Paolo when you meet with him? Uh, uh, so, and blah, blah, blah. So everything you can do as a preparation for the visit. Then when the second macro phase is the interaction. And in the interaction, usually it should start Obviously, where there is a short presentation and the first five, 10 seconds can be relevant. So the way you introduce yourself, the first impression can be very important. But then basically the, the, the starting point should be analyzing customer needs. So you should figure out okay, who is Paolo, what the needs are, what the setting, the context. Uh, obviously, some of this you should have prepared in advance, as I said. But part of it will be when you are in, in, in a meeting with Paolo. And then after understanding what the needs are, you might try to um, uh, uh, design uh, or, or, or hypothesize some potential solution to customer needs. So what I have could be maybe of interest for you and maybe you drive, or, well, it could be A or B or C. Uh, could, could A be interesting for you or do you think B, B could be better? So you find to uh, progressively uh, gradually explore if some or if you understood the, what the needs actually are. So you ask, you ask for confirmation and you try to turn those needs into a potential solution. And this could go through uh, iteratively with, with subsequent phases, maybe uh, uh, revise a presentation. You obviously should have prepared part of the presentation in the planning pre-interaction phase, but then you can even uh, modify this and represent something different. And you will probably go through some negotiation, uh, objections handling, and you maybe need to involve some of your colleagues and, and, and bringing more information or a more customized solution to your customer needs. And if you, if you if at some point in time, you can actually close the deal, then this will uh, uh, just be the preliminary foundation for what happens after, uh, which is the, uh, the after sales, basically something that means, what can I do to, uh, first of all, to learn from my customer? What did I do right? What, did the, what could I have done differently? Is there any other business opportunity with this customer? Maybe can I get some references for some other customers? Can I develop an ongoing relationship with this customer? Can I learn from this customer? Asking for feedback, even after the relationship has been developed, means planning your own learning over time, which is a fundamental uh, precondition for improving. And again, maybe generating some insights, generating some ideas. What do you think would be something that we don't offer today, which could be interesting for you? And this is all, all these things. Uh, the glue that keeps all these things together is trust, because you can build trust, you should build trust. From the very preliminary moment, if you come and visit your customer for the first time, and you already know something relevant about them, because you did your homework in the preparation, in the planning phase, you are just building trust because the customer, you will make a difference because the customer will think, oh, you, this guy uh, got, knows who I am and knows what my problems could be. Did they, they invested time and energy and brain to figuring out who I am, what my needs could be. And that's, that's, where, start, that's where trust starts. And then by honestly interacting with the customer throughout the process, again, and bringing knowledge, not only yours, even telling the customer, I don't know. 
I don't know about this. I cannot give you a meaningful answer now, but if you trust me, I will, I will come back as soon as I can pick the relevant knowledge from my colleagues who are in charge of this. And uh, even saying, no, this is, I cannot do this, or there's something better than me on this, but I can do something better on something else. So it, it, the drivers of trust are manifold, uh, uh, but if you build trust, then the customer will be willing to share even sensitive information and generating insight with you because you demonstrated over time that you turned knowledge into value. And, and, and then you, you can, chances are that you can do the same over and over again. So trust is based on the past, but it is very much forward looking and it paves the ground for further reinforcing the relationship over time. And which is what we want to do because most of the time uh, uh, you invest a lot of time and resources to building a partnership with the customer. You want to keep that customer as much as possible over time. And doing this, uh, so the return on your time and, and effort investment should be as long as possible. And trust is a facilitator, the precondition for this to happen. Uh, Paolo, you've obviously uh, worked with a lot of sales salespeople, sales executives uh, in the past 20 years or more. Uh, so what would be, from your perspective, the fundamental ingredient to succeed in sales? What are some of the key things that great salespeople do that maybe some of these young people and all of us can apply in terms of sales? Ah, that's a very good question. Again, I think that I always ask salespeople, tell me what, 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 what is the secret ingredient? for being successful in your job. It's difficult to find a, one single secret ingredient, to be honest. I think it's a combination of different things. Uh, some of them I already mentioned them. I think that curiosity is important uh, because uh, curiosity means, I think to me is, is, is a great aggregation of many things, which is you love life. If you're curious, that means that you love life. And if you love life, you have a lot of positive energy and positive energy in sales is very important. And um, it means that it, it is a precondition for everything to happen. Uh, because that means that if you have positive energy, you will probably be more willing to develop the knowledge you mean. I mean, knowledge is usually is a must have, but it depends on what you sell. If what you sell is a commodity, knowledge per se is not very relevant, no? But if you, if you love life, you love others, you love knowledge, you love everything. And if you have a passion, for passion is the number one word. We did some research on this. And actually, we, 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 we analyzed the words. We do text analyzed uh, because we ask people right now what you think is a, is a secret ingredient. And, and word number one was passion. And I always say, if you look at many corporate uh, statements, you will say, oh, we passionately do something, right? But I always say, I've been lucky enough to study ancient Greek when I was younger. And I know where the, where, where the word passion comes from, because it comes from ancient Greek. It comes from basically pathos and pathé, which means basically suffering. I always tell people, well, if you really have passion for something, that means that you're ready to suffer for that. You, 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 you love something, you love your job so much that you're willing to suffer for this. And suffering for this means you got in, in sales, you got to accept failure. Because in selling, most of the time you will be failing and it is very personal. It is your customer, your opportunity. Your, it's not a corporate thing. It's your customer who will not buy from you. Your customer will tell you, no, thank you. And that's very personal. It's very harmful. Best as people are those who survive failures with enthusiasm. And because failure is definitely part of selling. It's ups and downs. If you sell something, you feel so great because it's your accomplishment. But if you don't sell, which happens, it's really personally harmful. That's pathos. That's passion. You have we are ready to suffer. Why is that? Because you might have a lot of intrinsic motivators, because you like. You like the, the thrill of, 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 you know, of making a difference, making an impact personally. You like to be independent. You are the owner of your destiny. That's what sales people, great sales people are great entrepreneurs because they, they take the responsibility. They take the risk. 
They love what they do. They uh, uh, strongly believe in what they do. And they, they don't care about failing. If you think about it, all these things are what make entrepreneurs great entrepreneurs. So I think there's a big overlap between being great entrepreneurs and great salespeople. And uh, uh, I think, and I really wish people to try to experiment a little bit of selling in their life, in everything they do, even a small project. I will say, but I give you a personal example. I, I, I have a charity, okay? And this has nothing to do with my job. I have a charity and I, I have a purpose with this. I really believe in, in, in gathering funds for some noble causes. And what I do is I challenge myself. Can I sell my charity to someone? Can I raise funds on this? And I train myself saying, let me see how good I am in selling my idea. And I compete with an unlimited set of wonderful people who do wonderful words, wonderful things with their charities. But each of us, we can all train ourselves in, in selling something. Ideas, uh, especially if it is a charity or something positive for the, for the well-being of poor people, for example, we have a reason for doing this. And we are generously trying to exercise and train ourselves on being good salespeople. It, it's, it's a wonderful thing because if we have a noble cause, if really, if we have a great entrepreneurial idea, if we have a great product, a great service, if it's, we have a good idea, why not selling it? And we should have such a, a huge enthusiasm and we should, uh, we should uh, fight against everything who's impeding us to, to, to fully deploy uh, what, what the value of what we believe in. So I think that we can all train and I, I, I stimulate everyone to try to do this, to challenge themselves and let, let me put the challenge of selling something and, and let me see if I can do it. And if I fail, I will keep doing it. And I will try to get making myself better over and over in selling something, whatever. Because it, you, all of all, all the people who listen to us today, I'm sure they will have dozens of uh, of situations in their lives they, where they will have to sell something valuable, and they will find it difficult to uh, deliver this message to their counterparts. It could so, be a long message to someone you love. It could be a, 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 a relevant life guideline for your sons. It could be a difficult circumstance with your friends. It could be a business situation dozens of times. And if you're not ready to that, if you're not prepared to that, you will probably miss a lot of opportunities. Don't do that. Train yourself in selling. That's why we need to start early. So uh, now we talked about what you should do and you know how to make yourself better. Is there something that you know uh, successful salespeople or unsuccessful uh, do, but uh, uh, successful people avoid in terms of what we should avoid in terms of what not to do when when you're engaging uh, in sales interactions with customers? Not to do, I think you you, you should not. Uh, um be unprepared. You should be prepared whenever you meet with the customer. Uh, you should be very honest. Again, I think that we, we all want to have long lasting relationships with customers. I mean, you might have exceptions, but in, in the vast majority of cases, you will want to develop long lasting relationships based on trust. And trust is based on competence, is based on honesty, and, and, and is based on also on your ability to keep promises. So you should make reasonable promises and you should uh, organize things in such a way that you can actually get there. So if you're not organized, if you're not honest, if you're not competent, uh, you will fail. That's, that's definitely for sure. Um, so I think this side, the, 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 if, you, if you don't care about others, I think you can hardly succeed in sales nowadays. We have a lot of stereotyping about, you know, the, the, the Hollywood movies, which basically propose a completely different stereotype of salesperson. I think that nowadays, uh, the vast majority of cases, you need something completely different from that stereotype. So, yeah, I mean, in that sense, a lot of people, when they think about sales or selling or salespeople, they always think about those uh, annoying uh, people that just try to, uh, sell you something uh, that you really don't need 
So uh, I, I think we it's important to move past uh, from that uh, perspective in that sense. Yes, I think most companies don't want that 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 kind of salesperson. I mean, they might need uh, some pusher uh, in the in the short term, but they basically want someone very professional who's getting who's willing to accept the challenge of managing much more complexity than in the past. So most of these people in the world now should possess some financial acumen, should be more long-term oriented, should be more able to see the big picture in the organization. So for example, the financial implications of what, what they do, for example, and, uh, and, and don't, don't want to take the risk of a single salesperson harming the branding and the reputation of the entire organization. So uh, it's, it's, it's really too risky. So uh, I think that uh, this is a highly professionalized world in the, mo in the vast majority of cases. And what I have seen in these last 20 years is that definitely companies are investing much more in these uh, 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 profiles. We have a lot of executive MBAs in the past used to come from marketing. Now most of them come from sales uh, because this is a demonstration that companies, companies are investing these profiles and job profiles and these people because they represent the company in front of the market and nowadays you can't afford having uh, uh, pushy people out there they there could be in some businesses but in, in the vast majority majority of cases they they tend and they will tend to be much more exceptions to me nowadays especially with the developments of technology either a salesperson is a value creator for the company and for the customer or is is uh, the destiny is that he or she will disappear because we'll be completely uh, substituted or replaced by by technology most most of the things that they used to do in the past so if they become smart sellers that's a different story and that's where they actually can make a difference but again yes there's a lot of stereotyping i think and oftentimes especially also with our students i always tell my students you know hollywood movies are the enemy because they, they, they tend to promote a stereotype, which is not there for the vast majority of companies I know. It could be still there in some industries, in some cases, but there is an overrepresentation of that field. And there's a total underrepresentation of the world of professional sales, which is very relevant. And, and, the, and it's very promising, I think also for most uh, um, um, workplace opportunities. Uh, you mentioned already that sales is hard, selling is hard. Uh, you, all, you also talked about the importance of passion in order to succeed in sales. Uh, but when you deal with so much failure, with so many no's, of course, if you don't have passion, uh, then you have a problem. But do you maybe have some uh, tips or tricks or advice for people uh, when they engage and interact with customers and get so many no's, how to stay motivated, how to get yourself and move forward uh, in your relationship, maybe with that customer, and, but also with numbers, a uh, number of others. That, that's very challenging. I mean, there is a threshold where you can also genuinely understand that maybe it's not for you, because that's not always that you keep keep going, going, going. If you see that it is not, uh, your job, you should live it because it's not for everyone. I always tell my students, it's not for everyone. There is a lot of research showing that usually the percentage of, of sales people reaching their quota is between 50 to 60 percent. So uh, almost one out of two will not reach their target. And oftentimes, the ones who, who do not reach their target tend to do it systematically. And so the one who, who succeeds, succeeds systematically. So I think that there is also great responsibility by companies and supervisors in detecting those who actually fit that profile and those who don't. Now, uh, for those who obviously, who, most people, they need a bit of time to, uh, um, to get uh, to be productive in the role. Um, what they can do, I think, they need to find uh, um, uh, other motivators. And one, one key thing is learning. So the key thing is trying to uh, 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 dare, dare to challenge yourself in, and, and even asking customers, what did I do wrong? What could I have done differently? 
And most people will not do that because they will not uh, dare uh, uh, challenging themselves so much. They will simply blame the customer or provide some other external attribution. Uh, what is the reason behind my failure? Why is it some, something else? It's not me. And But there's nothing bad with us in failing. I mean, we all fail every day uh, in, many, in many things. Uh, but uh, the, what makes the difference is to what extent am I willing to, to learn from this? How can I design and plan and manage my own learning about my failures? And this is, starts from uh, the uh, psychological strength of taking responsibility for yourself, accepting failure, and being willing to share with your customers and your colleagues both the positive and negative things. Um, asking colleagues, and, and there is a lot of jealousy inside this organization about sharing both successes and failure, because if you succeed, you don't want to share your tricks with, your, with, with the weaker colleagues. If you fail, you don't want to look like the, the loser. And so again, even facilitate, this is an organizational thing. And, and managers and organizations should, should create a, a, a setting where they can facilitate a, a culture of learning from mistakes. Well, uh, where, where, where learning from mistakes is more important than simply telling ourselves how good we are. And, but it's, it's pretty rare. It's not easy to create this culture. And so this should be done at the organizational level. Then within a specific organization, a, a, every individual member could be more or less willing and able to uh, uh, ask for feedbacks and even to uh, uh, or analyze themselves. And so carving out time, because you need time for doing this, carving out time for analyzing yourself, which means asking honest feedbacks to your colleagues, asking your supervisor, come with me to in front of a customer and tell me what, what, what I should or could be doing differently. Taking, carving out time for going maybe with a more expert, experienced this person to learn some of the tricks for that person. Carving out time for talking with some of your, your customers, asking for a feedback. No matter if they buy or don't buy, but asking for them, okay, wh what do you think about me? Help me become better. And uh, uh, it's, it's all these things which make learning a more long-term oriented, I would say also more valuable target than simply reaching the short-term monetary target of related to your sales achievements. Uh, so one of the final things that I would like to talk about uh, and for you to provide insights is since we're developing innovations through this uh, digital innovation incubator, uh, is there some something uh, specific or something different that people or sales departments or salespeople do uh, when they approach in selling innovations? So when you're selling something that is new, something that is different, something that maybe you don't have a reference point to, how to approach in selling, uh, maybe even ideas to teammates or to supervisors or to managers or to your customers, how to approach sales in that context. Oh, that's, that, that, that's very interesting. I think that uh, this is always the most valuable part of selling. If you can something sell something new, whatever it is, it is an idea, a new service, a new solution, and it is always where since people feel more uncomfortable for the very sim uh, simple fact that customers usually are uh, change averse. So they don't want to innovate. So unless you have a, a smoking gun where you can say, okay, this here's the proof. So we have beta tested this with some customers and now we can prototype it and then we can replicate it and we can demonstrate that it works. So we create the best case reference usually you need, to, you need to convince yourself first that, that what, what, what you're doing works. So creating some uh, best case in any, any circumstance where you, where you want to sell something new is important. Uh, so um, creating a best case and then uh, uh, um, uh, understanding to what extent it can be replicated is, is very important. And this, doing this formalizing this knowledge about uh, successful innovation cases is, is not very easy because it, it, it has to do with a lot of men, mental framing and, and, and intellectual ability 
to uh, uh, formalize something which is very uh, messy and very uh, difficult to prototype, right? But doing this means, uh, means uh, um, trying to create, the, create the, the preconditions for communicating it again better to your customers. So most companies try to support their salespeople in doing this. If they don't, then every salesperson should try to create to, to create some best cases, to find the best way to communicate these best cases to someone else. And then they have to uh, um, challenge challenge customer's assumptions, which is very difficult. And challenging uh, uh, customer assumptions usually uh, means reframing what value is or could be in their mind. And to do this, you should start basically from understanding uh, uh, their current business and try to figure out what could be done differently and why. Where are some uh, potential gains or actual pains are and then trying to explore and co-create something, letting as much as possible the customer specify why something happens and what could be the consequences of the, some of the problems that they have or some of, some of the things that they could be improving. So detecting potential problems, current problems, potential problems, unexploited opportunities, uh, is something that should be made together with the customer. And again, by starting from, okay, tell me uh, what is your current situation? Tell me something which is troublesome or where you think that something that could be improved, something that, is, is there any chance, any opportunity that you are missing? And if there is, a maybe there, there is no problem today, but what if, what happened if this problem had to arise? What happened if you're not exploiting this opportunity? What if you could find a way to, to, to fix that problem or to exploit that opportunity? And then you, you, sh you need to try to help the customer find the answer in a sense. It's a process of discovery. Uh, discovery together, what could be the ramifications of the consequences of something, uh, which is far to be uh, far from being a, a predefined set of things. So, but again, it takes trust, it takes time, it takes a, a structured approach when talking to customers. I couldn't agree more. Uh, thank you for all for all the inputs. Do you maybe have any uh, last messages for all the young students out there uh, in Croatia? No, the only thing is again, don't be, uh, don't have prejudice uh, against selling, or don't think that you know what selling is. Try to even spend some time selling something. And uh, again, it could be your ideas, a, a, a non-for-profit project, uh, or just uh, uh, having spent maybe maybe uh, some uh, stage period in a company working on the front line. I think this is very formative. This will provide you with a lot of insights. This will challenge you and will develop your interpersonal communication skills. And interpersonal communication skills are useful whatever your job will be in your life, I guess. So this is something that I think is worthwhile. Uh, and so be curious about it. Maybe read some books about it and uh, uh, ask uh, some salespeople uh, what they think about their job and uh, never stop thinking, okay, how can I learn something from selling which could be useful for my life? Thank you, Paolo, very much uh, for this uh, inspirational talk and a lot of perspective on sales, selling innovation. Uh, I hope to see you soon in Croatia and see you soon. Thank you very much, Philip. I hope that I provide some insights or food for thought to people and I really wish all young people the best. And I'm so enthusiastic about the young generations and I think they have a lot of opportunities and I really uh, uh, when, when I talk to them I see so much brightness in their eyes and so many uh, smiling attitudes that I, 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 I can only be positive so be positive and uh, uh, the important thing is really don't stop dreaming. If you, you are young, you must have some dreams. I didn't have many when I was young. I sure I had, probably I forgot, but I should have had more. So <laughs> I try to stimulate you to 
keep positive enthusiasm in everything you do. Don't let, I mean, life can be hard for a number of reasons. Don't let life turn you on. Uh, I mean, keep, turn you down. So don't always try to be positive. And um, the future is bright. And I, I really wish you all the best for your life in general and for your professional career as well. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.